I began this project already in 2003 when I uh, was living with a family in Cairo. So I was doing a completely different project and a different film project as well. Living with camel drivers at the Giza Plateau, uh, doing a project about tourism, how they sell camel trips to tourists at the Giza Plateau. But while I was living with this family, there was um, a wedding and the youngest brother in the family of three brothers, they live in this sort of the same house with the camels at the bottom and the sheep on the roof and then all the brothers and the parents in between. So the youngest brother, he was married and his wife came from uh, one of the other streets in this small community and it was a beautiful wedding with thousands of colored lamps and uh, uh, dances on camels and, and lots of money being thrown around and precisely as a wedding should be. So the custom in this area of the world is that if you have a wedding then you go and have Shah al Asl, it's uh, honeymoon. Because they don't have that much money, you, you consume your marriage in your new flat. And that flat was uh, just above where I was living. I was living with the older brother in this family. And, and so in the beginning it seemed to be all right. Um, but after, after a couple of days, um, a week, uh, we began to hear uh, uh, noises. And not the kinds of noises that you would want to hear from a newly wed couple. Uh, but uh, screams, things being thrown around. Um, then suddenly the husband would come running down with tears and uh, be very sort of uh, out of his uh, normal self. And the wife would come running down with in tears. And, and um, so, so troubles began and, and they accelerated uh, quite quickly. And, um, and she began to, to really behave in a strange kind of way. And, uh, and so at, at, at a certain point she had to move into our flat where I was living with the oldest brother because she couldn't, I mean, she couldn't stand the sight of her husband. If she saw him, she had to throw things at him. And she, she then began to speak in tongues and she had got very severe fevers and, and it was not very pleasant. Um, she also behaved sort of morally uh, transgressively uh, and, uh, and did, did certain things. But then what, what, what happened was that, I mean, we, have, we had, the whole family was in a situation of crisis because it's, it's a big problem economically if, if a marriage uh, fails. Uh, it's a big investment for these families. Something had to be done and I was, I was quite sure what was going on. She was sort of developing a psychosis or having some kind of psych uh, uh, psychosomatic symptoms. And I, I offered to uh, actually pay to go to a psychiatrist or to a hospital and I also thought she should move back to her mother's house. And, and they were kind of agreeing that this could be a possibility, but on the other hand, they thought it would be better to go to a sheikh, a Muslim sheikh, an exorcist, and uh, check if it had anything to do with magic or uh, evil spirits called jinn. And I have to say, I was, I was a young bachelor student of anthropology, so I knew there was something like spirit possession, but it was not part of my immediate world. It was very strange for me. And I thought I knew these people quite well because I had been living with them, and suddenly all of this magic and jinn stuff uh, erupted. The experience of living with this family for, uh, for several months while this was going on and while exorcists were coming and reading the Quran or blessing honey and cleaning us, uh, the whole house had to be cleaned and was really uh, for me, uh, I, I guess you could call it a culture shock <laughs> and I was, I was shaken a little bit in my beliefs like I had, I think what I, what I discovered was that I had very explicit ideas about what was wrong and how it should be handled and that this was some kind of psychosomatic symptoms uh, but what I discovered was that I guess the that vocabulary covers over things in my own world that I actually don't know much about either. And so the, the way I thought their vocabulary, like jinn possession, magic and stuff like that, was really bullshit and covering over something that they didn't know what, what, what was. I, I became aware that actually psychosomatic symptoms and psychosis and schizophrenia and all these concepts are also ways of dealing with the invisible in human life. And uh, and so I was shaken to a certain extent, extent and I also found myself um, 
even though I was absolutely sure we should go to a psychiatric hospital, I couldn't help, uh, when, especially when I entered the bathroom in the lower floor where the camels are and the parents are living, <laughs> which is a very filthy <laughs> toilet. And these gin spirits, they live in this parallel world where everything filthy they kind of like. So when I found myself entering this toilet, I couldn't help sort of trying to protect myself with a small homemade supplication or something. So, so kind of like being caught between different worlds or different ontologies about these things. That was, my, that was what aroused my initial interest for this topic. And then goes a long story about I decided to read about these things and I studied them and I applied for a PhD and I moved to Denmark and um, and in Denmark it became, uh, I, I started m working with Muslim refugees in Denmark and there it became very much this, this antagonism between uh, the Danish state and the Muslim refugee population and uh, especially between the psychiatric, Danish psychiatric system and the um, sort of Salafi uh, uh, form of Islam. It was a humbling experience. So the, the, the experience of being absolutely sure that you know what the other does not know. You know better, I know better what's going on. These people are somehow uncivilized. Uh, they should be educated. I became aware that maybe this is not the, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we are also struggling with these things in our own kinds of ways. And, um, I think it's it's a healthy uh, it was a healthy humbling experience to to just discover how what we what we think about uh, you know as a science carved out in stone the psychiatric system also has its own blind spot maybe for me this was one of the um, the interesting uh, outcomes of the research that you can take a marginalized population and a, you know a population that has been condemned in in many different ways in, in Danish society and pushed to the mar margins. But once you enter that community, you'll see that they actually have a different perspective and they have real criticisms that are useful even for, you know, for us as mainstream Danish people uh, because they, they see things from a different perspective. Yeah. The Muslim community, they have been exposed to quite severe uh, media attention and um, also journalists working with candid cameras and uh, sort of trying to expose Islamic crazy stuff. Um, so they have had a hard time in Danish media. Uh, but, uh, and the, there is lots of research being done there and so they're really, maybe the, you know, the a lot of research is being made, a lot of intelligence uh, reports are being written and so on and so forth. Um, but it's all about extremism, radicalism, radicalization, terrorism, fundamentalism. <laughs> so when I uh, went out there and asked, so what about healing? Uh, does whatever you do in the mosque have anything to do with healing? Then they were very supportive of this idea that we should make a, a film about that. And um, the psychiatric uh, institutions were a little bit more difficult because you have much more, uh, you, you need to apply for a lot of, uh, eth you need to go through ethical committees and things like that. And there is also maybe a, uh, people are more protective professionally, um, but I managed and I found some people who were supportive of the project. And I guess my role in, in their lives at that point was to be a kind of witness to what was going on and they, some of them probably found it helpful that I was there to observe and, and as a witness.